Welcome to the Flying Baton, the magical land of beginning band. Coming to you from the beautiful Shenandoah Valley of Virginia, your host, Charlie Nesmith. Hello, everybody, and welcome back to the Flying Baton podcast. Thank you so much for coming today. We have a really awesome interview lined up with Brett Dodson, who's a pro trumpet player, and he's going to give us lots of tips on how to start beginners on trumpet. One thing that's going to be a little different of the podcast today is normally right before the interview, I do like a beginning band pick of the week where I play a piece of music that you might be able to use in your band. Um, but I've decided to do something a little bit different this time. I've recorded video for the interview and for just about everything else. And we're going to try uploading the podcast to YouTube. Some people have commented they really want a visual, especially when we're talking about pedagogical things. It can be helpful sometimes. So we will start uploading all the podcast in video format to YouTube for a little while and see how it goes and see how you guys like it. And of course, it will always be available as audio. With that said, let's get to it. Brett Dodson is a musician based in Arlington, Virginia, who enjoys work as an educator, performer, and conductor. He maintains a trumpet studio composed of students from the schools of Fairfax and Loudoun counties. He has performed with the brass bands of Northern Virginia, Capital Wind Symphony, Fairfax Wind Symphony, and the Disneyland All-American College Band. He assists schools throughout the region in a capacity of sectional instructor and ensemble clinician, and is engaged regularly as a guest conductor and adjudicator. Mr. Dodson holds degrees from James Madison University and Bowling Green State University. Thank you so much for coming on the show. Yeah, absolutely. I'm, you know, happy you invited me. I hope what I have to share is helpful. I do want to start with two caveats, though. One, I made the mistake of, in preparation, listening to a few episodes. And the first one that I listened to was the flute one. And she is amazing. <laughs> I was like, oh my gosh, <laughs> like, like, I can't live up to that. And then two is just, you know, kind, kind of along that same line it is like the trumpet world can be controversial sometimes in the way that we think or talk about things and people have different opinions. So like if I say something that, you know, someone doesn't agree with or you've heard differently, well, you know, this, this is what works for me or what I've found to work. And if it doesn't work for you, fine, you know, ex explore something different. Yeah, absolutely. I totally agree with that. And as far as Helen goes, yeah, there's a reason that I, I heard her session at Midwest and then was like, can you give me a flute lesson today? Yeah. And she said <laughs> yes, right? And we That's went awesome. to like yeah. this like conference room that wasn't being used in the hotel next to the, the convention center. I think very few, few, very few teachers in the world have the level of passion that she has. <laughs> yeah, she, she clearly draws her life force from teaching people flute. <laughs> yes. Oh, that's great. I loved it. Well, um, we had Sammy Charias on the show, and she recommended you very highly for this episode. That's great. I'm in Sammy's band room like twice a week during the school year. Awesome. What's your uh, what's your role over there? Pre-pandemic, I did a little bit of, of sectional teaching for them, but actually Martin Blount is, is Sammy's co-teacher. And Martin was the first person that said, hey, you want to come teach trumpet lessons? And I said, sure. And now it's grown into like a really robust thing. But I'm at their school twice a week after school teaching lessons. It's kind of the main way that I see them all the time. That's awesome. And for our listeners, could you tell us what school that is? Oh, yeah, that's Brambleton Middle School out in Ashburn in Loudoun County. A lot of good band things going on at Brambleton. Did you used to be a band director yourself? I did. I was a public school band teacher for n nine years. Most of that was at Kilmer Middle School in Vienna, Virginia in Fairfax County. And I really loved that. I had a great time. I did a year at, at Woodson High School when that job opened. And professionally, I really loved that. Like, it was like, oh, yeah, this is like, this is my band job. I am going to retire from here. And I, I finished that first year and it was like, oh, I have done nothing but band. And I don't know that, like, doing nothing but band until I retire is the healthiest thing. So actually, I, mm. I took that as like sort of the cue that, you know, if you're going to not do this until you retire, now is probably the time you need to decide to, to make that change happen. Are you just going to come back one more year and then that's going to be 20 whatever more years? Yeah. <laughs> so I'm actually, I, I say I do more music teaching now, though, than when I was teaching music. <laughs> just because there's, I don't really have any administrative overhead. I do, I do still get to, to get to conduct an ensemble. I direct a youth band called Northern Virginia Youth Wins. So I see them once a week. So I kind of get to flex that, you know, and, and enjoy being in front of a group still. But really the main thing now is, is private trumpet teaching. 
All right, man. Well, I think with that said, we'll get to some of our more trumpet specific questions. If you are auditioning, say, a elementary school student for the trumpet, what are some characteristics that you think that you would look for or some things that might make learning the trumpet more difficult? So I don't really think that there are too many things that like if you see them, you're like, ah, oh, trumpet's not going to go so well. Or like if you see them, oh, well, trumpet's going to be great for you. It's it's more that they they have a good sense of the, the, the proprioception of what they're actually doing with their their lips. You know, there's there's so many students that no matter how many ways you explain things or try to get them to do something different, it's it's like it just does not connect to what they're actually physically doing. So, you know, if, if a student has very low proprioception with with the control of, of of their embouchure corners or just the way they manipulate their lips, then it, it doesn't mean it's a, it's a no go, but it's it's it might be a rocky start, and often a rocky start means a, a a rocky lifetime on the instrument. Gotcha. What is your process of leading them to make their first sound? Sure. So the the first thing I do is I make sure that they can kind of hold the instrument. I don't get too picky about holding it at first, but I, I make sure that they're holding it basically in a way that they can control the weight of it, so that they can control the the pressure of the mouthpiece against their embouchure. Like that's kind of like just enough, and then. I, let me, let me make one maybe big point before I get into the process that, that I think one thing that gets kind of turned around in the trumpet teaching process is that getting some type of a buzz is prioritized way too soon, or it's prioritized above making sure that the placement of the mouthpiece and the embouchure makes sense. You know, that you just get any sort of, yep, you just go like this, you know, and the kid does that and they do it into the instrument. It kind of makes a sound and they're like, all right, we'll start with that. I, I really think that that does not set things up well. And that the more priority you can give to what shape is like and, and the way that the air moves through an aperture and that they control, they may keep the control of, of the embouchure while they do that, that that's going to eventually produce a buzz that, that works really well. So the, the first thing that I have them do, I, I like to use a mirror. So, I mean, you know, there's, there's tons of cheap mirrors available. So, you know, get, get a ton of cheap mirrors for your band, band room because they need to see what they're doing. And the first thing that I have them do is just form an embouchure and freeze it, you know, firm your corners, think M and just stare at it. Like, don't let it move for five or 10 seconds. And it's funny how hard that is. Like it wiggles or they hold it for two seconds and then they stop. And you're like, no, I, I said five or 10 seconds and I'm counting this for you. So, you know, I, I'm pretty persistent about like doing that a few times. And then once I feel that like, okay, you, you've kind of got the control. Your, your corners have, have firmed up a little bit. Your lips look like they're drawn together the right way. And depending on how many I'm working with at a time, if I'm working one-on-one, -on -one, obviously that's kind of what I do the most and prefer. I may or may not talk about rolling in a little bit. It kind of just depends on what their lips look like when they firm their corners. With a lot of mm. students, once they firm their corners, that's kind of enough to draw the lips together. If, it, if they look too relaxed, I'll make up some number, like say, okay, now roll them in 4%. You know, and if that looks like not enough, I'll say, okay, do eight. To just kind of like start to wiggle it and manipulate it until like, okay, that, look, that looks about right. Once they can do that, once they can hold it and freeze it, then the next step is they need to be able to blow air without letting it change shape, except for the fact that, a, that an aperture forms. And that's usually the first really difficult thing is that like everything just goes slack or the air hits it and the, the, the lips roll forward. So we, we spend some time with that. And I, I've had students that in their first lesson, we don't get past that. And I say, okay, this is what you need to come back next week able to do before we move on to the next, next thing. So I really do spend a lot of time there and make sure they're staring at the mirror while they do it. With, with the aperture, it, it should be a semi-wide slit. Like it's probably going to look a little bigger than what you think it should because eventually a mouthpiece is going to be put on it and it's going to control it and change the size of it. But when it's just blowing, blowing loose air, it, it should look pretty relaxed except for the corners being semi-firmed and whatever amount of slight roll in you want to think about. Um, how do you articulate to them how to firm their corners? All right. So I, I usually say make your corners feel like they're hugging the sides of your teeth. You know, like if you engage just a little bit that you kind of feel them come in towards your teeth. And then I see what that looks like. Cause I, I, I find with trumpet, it's like something that works great, like four times in a row. Then all of a sudden I say it to like the next three and it, it does the opposite of what I want. So I just, I, I try to have different ways of, 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 of talking about that. Or I'll say, you know, start a smile, but don't let it turn into one. And then, you know, they're looking in a mirror while they do this. So I'll say, okay, stop it there. Or you went a little too far, back it up some. Like, don't, don't let the corners draw back so much. 
Does that make sense? Yeah, absolutely. Okay. And then are you having them blow through the mouthpiece with just air at the beginning stages? Yeah, so so once they can once they can keep the aperture with, without anything on it, once they can keep things in shape while they, while they blow blow air, then preferably I will place the mouthpiece on, on, on the round butcher for them the first time. And then we just, we, we blow air through the mouthpiece. And I very specifically tell them, I say, do not try to buzz. Do not make some effort towards a buzz. Stare at the mirror, keep your shape, move the air through the mouthpiece without letting the shape change. And usually somewhere along the lines of doing that, especially if we, if I start to say to speed up the air and that's, that's a step along the way at some point, once it looks good, we'll start to speed up the air, but like some little buzz sounds will just kind of happen. And they're almost always very relaxed and very natural. And as soon as that happens, it's like, there we are. That's, that's, that's a buzz. That's what we're trying to do. And that's why we've been so picky about you maintaining the shape for however long it's taken, whether it's been, you know, half of a 30 minute lesson or, you know, a, a two week effort in, in, in trying to get that done. But as soon as, as soon as that buzz starts to catch, then I, then I start to treat them a little differently. I should say though, the, the, ideally my, my first sound with them, I don't want it to be on the mouthpiece. I think that the best place to make the first sound on the trumpet is, is the lead pipe. And the lead pipe is the part that goes from where you put the mouthpiece in until the main tuning slide. So I'll remove the main tuning slide. We'll put the mouthpiece in. And we'll use the lead pipe. And the reason that I really like the lead pipe is it's kind of like, like an in-between the trumpet and the mouthpiece. The trumpet assists the buzz. The, the, the trumpet makes buzzing a lot easier because of the resistance it has, because of the amount of tubing, that it kind of stabilizes the buzz and makes it a, an easy, relaxed thing to produce. But the, we, we know that the, the trumpet has very specific slots to it. So if you're not buzzing the right speed, it, it doesn't go well. The mouthpiece is kind of the opposite of that. Like you can buzz any pitch, but it doesn't provide really much resistance. So it can be more physically effortful than what we want at first to, mm. to make a buzz happen. And the lead pipe is kind of in between the two that it's got some wiggle room to it, like the mouthpiece, but it's got a little more resistance like the trumpet. And if you, if you're buzzing on the lead pipe, it does have partials. It has different shelves that you can hit, but a beginner is only going to be playing on that bottom partial. And ideally you would get that bottom partial to sound like a trumpet E flat E or F. If, if an embouchure is working really well, it's going to sound like that trumpet F, but anything in that area. And we'll, we'll spend some time there. You're just trying to make some long tones on, on the lead pipe until they start to like get comfortable with producing it for more than just a moment or so. So I take it. You're not a big fan of free buzzing. You know, I do it in the car. I think that like when I, when I free buzz, my priority is I'm trying to make it feel as close to my buzzing on the trumpet as possible, meaning like as, as relaxed as buzzing on the trumpet, because it's, it's way more effortful. Yeah. And I, I think, and I think that's maybe one of the worst things that you could have beginners do right from the beginning, because all they're going to do is, is press their lips together really hard. So there's basically no aperture and, and you get the classic kind of sound and when you if you buzz into the trumpet that way it it'll it'll produce a sound you know you can you can play a, a you know a second line g on the trumpet buzzing that way and you know you kind of you know say oh well you know they're in their first year you know it's it'll it'll, it'll get better and for some of them it will but a lot of, a lot of it really kind of doesn't if that's the way they learn to buzz from the start do you have any strong feelings about what you want their first pitch on the trumpet to be well if you've used the lead pipe to start trumpet E flat E or F like it, it will be the same pitch. So if I'm one-on-one -on -one with a student, I'll figure out what that pitch is on the lead pipe that they're buzzing. And if, if need be, I'll coach them to be a little bit higher. Like lots of times it'll focus a little bit too low and I'll, I'll coach it to be higher, but I don't try to prioritize that it has to be up to F, which is kind of where you want to eventually get it to be, but it doesn't really need to be there from the start. So like an E flat an E an F on the trumpet, I think those are really good kind of starting notes. You can go higher if, if it, if it comes out easily, but those for just kind of all purpose, you know, classroom or, or individual teaching, I, I think those are good pitches to start with. So one, one thing I noticed a lot with beginners, I probably say like the biggest hang up I've seen is the kids want to buzz with like kind of the inside of their lip and it produces a very low kind of like cow sound. You know, you can see some of the shiny part kind of sticking out. Um, they, they roll their lips forward. Yeah, they want to push a little bit sometimes, mm. and then they they get like like the low, like the really low. Right, I know, sometimes. I know what you mean like that. That like it's like 
somewhere below a C. You know, it's just kind of yeah, in that, yeah. like 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 non pitch territory. Yeah, cow sounds. Some of us call it. <laughs> sure. Yeah, that I think you know can be helped by the 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 stage of making sure that when you blow air through an aperture without anything on it, that the lips don't roll forward. Like when they start mm. to gain the muscular control to to do that, and they can see it happening. You can kind of, you know, refer to that. Hey, remember, you know, 10 minutes ago when we were just looking at the mirror and trying to keep the shape as you, as, as, as you blow that, that, that helps that. But as yeah. soon as they're buzzing the right way, they, they feel the easiness of it. Mm. It's, it's not like a difficult thing to keep replicating. Like, you know, you, it, it, you might have to coach them the first days of it, but like, as soon as they kind of start to get the hang of it, that's what they do. So do you hit a point with their development in which you stop using buzzing as part of the daily routine? Or do you think it should always be a part of the daily routine if possible? I have a ton of students that I still make them start every day on the lead pipe because maybe they've gone through an embouchure change. And it's just mm. kind of the thing that like it, it creates the best homeostasis <laughs> as far as the, the way things are functioning. So we, I start there a lot with with students that are going through some type of a sound production issue. But as far as like classroom mouthpiece buzzing, I, I think just don't make it the very first thing you do. Make a sound on the trumpet or make a sound on the lead pipe first. And don't do a lot of it. Don't do enough buzzing that it becomes strenuous. Don't stress getting high notes out. Make it sound relaxed. When it, like if you do a siren, kind of, you know, an up and down type thing, don't try to make it go overly high or low because you want it to be smooth and continuous. You know, prioritize that it sounds smooth, that there aren't breaks or gaps in it. And that's, that's going to bring more benefit than the ability to, to buzz super high or super low on, on the mouthpiece. How much audiation or singing do you utilize in your lesson? You know, I, I actually didn't a lot until recently and not and, and starting recently, not for this purpose of a young player. I've, I've one of the biggest changes I've made in my private teaching recently is prioritizing learning things by ear. And it's because I kind of stumbled across a, a, a student who was really just incredibly good at it. And I was like, oh, I have to like, you know, run with this and, and help her to really be good at it, which means I need to figure out things about it because it's probably the thing that I'm the worst at as a, as, as a musician is being comfortable doing things by ear. I, I love notation. You know, I, I read really well. I sight read pretty well. But like, if you ask me to like, you know, hey, play this simple tune for us. Oh, I, I start to get nervous. And so, so I give them a weekly ear tune. And I make them, you know, learn it by scale degree. I make them be able to buzz it on the mouthpiece. I make them be able to sing it with numbers. And I've, I've found that to kind of help everything. So I haven't really used that in the classroom setting yet. But anything you can do to relate voice to trumpet, I think, is, is, is a good thing. So it doesn't have to be overly complex. You know, pick, pick a little simple folk tune that has a, a semi-small range to it. And that can be the thing that you use to do a little gentle buzzing or a little, you know, easy singing. So after you get into, um, you know, the past the very beginning stages and you start to work a lot more with lip slurs, how do you describe that process to them and lead them to getting a successful lip slur? Before I talk about the process, two maybe maybe big points that I, I think with lip slurs that I would just kind of, kind of advise, like get overlooked, but are for me, good to do. Make the intervals as small as possible to begin with. You know, if, if I walk into a band room and I hear, you know, the, the, the fundamentals routine, I hear a lot of like the first slur is open and you go from G down to C and then back up to G and then up to C. So you're going down a fifth and you're going up a fourth and it's a pretty big interval and it's a little clunky and it, it never really sounds like a, you know, beauty of tone exercise. It sounds more like a, yeah, let me muscle my way you know, to these different shelves on the trumpet kind of thing. So mm. make the interval as small as possible. So I like to start with, and this is with my developed students. By developed, I mean like ha half a year of playing at least. Start with one and three for your G. Because if you use the, the one and three alternate fingering for G, well then instead you can go down a fourth to D or just up a third to B. So, you, so mm. you're starting with a much smaller interval and then just go chromatically higher through the fingering sequence or start with all three um, from, from, you know, F sharp alternate fingering all three down to C sharp and then up to up to A sharp to do your smaller intervals. I saw a lot of those on the handouts that you sent me. Um, would we be able to post those on the on the show notes? Yes, please, please do, please do. I kind of with with beginning trumpets, I 
do things that I call like pre-notation, meaning like I don't really want you reading music while we do this. Like I just want to explain these exercises to you and I'm probably going to like, if it's a classroom, maybe I'll have something written out beforehand. If it's an individual, I just do it by pencil on like whatever scrap piece of paper I find and kind of build their initial routine. I think it's important not to link first trumpet sounds to also learning to read music notation at the same time. Like mm. do those things concurrently during your, your day, you know, you can have half of class with, you know, trumpet sound and half of class with notation, but don't, don't try to have them learning both of those concepts at, at the same time simultaneously. That's just, that's, yeah. that's a lot for them to do. And they, they need to be paying better attention to how they're making a sound rather than, you know, reading some notation system that's new to them. Mm -hmm. Anyway, I don't know that I finished the, 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 the lip slur question. I also, at first, if they're really young, I don't call them lip slurs. I just call them like high, low, high or high, low, because at first I don't really expect them to be tonguing them. Like we might just be doing air attacks on them. Or if I've taught the student how to tongue, we, we might be articulating them for some students. They pop out better if they put space in between them, like da, 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 some da, da, da. If, if it's connected, it's easier. So I do, it, I, I do both ways just to kind of, you know, give them as much perspective of what it feels like as possible. And then at some point when they start to gain good control with that, then I say, okay, now you're going to, I explain what a, what a slur is that you're going to slur downward to it, that you're not going to tongue and you're not going to stop the air. Aww. And at first it's just downward, like make it, make it feel relaxed, make both pitches center. And when that starts to kind of lock in, then, okay, now we're going to go back up. Duh. And of course that's going to be kind of clunky at first, but once they start to gain the control over it, like, oh, I need to speed up my air a little bit, or, you know, think a little firmer with my corners while I, while I go back up and, oh, I, I need to time those two things to happen at the same time. Then it starts to, to, to pop out easier. And as soon as they feel it being easy, they no longer really need to think about how to do it so much. They just, it kind of sticks. So when we're doing lip slurs in class between like three or four partials, sometimes I'll see students change the angle of the trumpet a little bit as they go up the, down the partials. Is that okay? Or is that considered like bad? I would avoid it. Any sort of a pivot is, is really manipulating the, the, the pressure distribution of, of the mouthpiece. And I don't think that you, your students would probably be doing it if they were like slurring through a scale passage that covered the same range. Like, can I assume that? So, so we wouldn't want to, we wouldn't want to like have a, a, a different pressure distribution for lip slur purposes than we would just regular moving around the instrument. So any, anytime something physical like that, like the, whether it's cheek puffing or, you know, they've got like a corner that isn't firm or they have a pivot that I get out the mirror again. And I say, well, you have to, you have to stare at yourself while you do this because you obviously don't really realize that you're doing it. And the, the mirror is, is, is really good for fixing that. All right. So I think one of the big pitfalls of learning any wind instrument, but especially brass instrument, is when the students first start learning the tonguing technique. How would you lead them to that for the first time? Sure. The words are tough. It's like you don't want to say too much about it and make them overthink it. Ideally, if, if I just say, so now we're going to start the sound, just like when you say da or ta. I actually mostly use da, even though I think a lot of the trumpet world uses a T syllable. I say da for, for most, most things. And I, I say, you know, think about how da has consonant sound at the start, your tongue pulls away and then there's vowel sound and the trumpet's going to happen the same way. You've been doing the vowel sound. Now we're adding a consonant sound to it. And I'll have them do by, by this point, by the time I teach tonguing, they've learned to move around a little bit on the instrument chromatically. Make sure I talk about moving chromatically in a couple of minutes. They've learned to move around chromatically a little bit. So I'll give them some simple little rhythm and it usually has both space and connectivity. So it'll be something like da, 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 down a half step, da, da, just to start to create some repetition. And until I really hear the repetition, I don't necessarily know what their problem is because they might just be overthinking it and simply by like putting it in a pattern and doing it repeatedly things either start to straighten themselves out or I hear, oh no, I think this is what you're doing and then dig in from there. As far as tongue placement goes, I'm assuming that's probably a, a question along the line here. There's a lot of things that work. And in general, if it sounds good, I don't try to change it. But some things that I have found that are pretty, pretty common 
are that if the student is tonguing exclusively on the roof of their mouth, if they don't feel any of the back of the teeth, it's going to lack clarity. I've, I've run into very few students that, that tell me that, oh yeah, I'm only on the roof of my mouth, but somehow it sounds clear. And even, and then if they do, I kind of doubt that maybe they're actually only on the roof of their mouth. And the other one is if they're tonguing really low and they're, they're pretty in between their teeth, like foo, that isn't too problematic at first when they're kind of in their first year or so of playing and range isn't very demanding. But I find that that becomes really problematic in, in, in high range articulation later, which I assume has to do with the, the proximity of, of the tongue to, to the aperture and just kind of getting in the way of, of things being really, really focused for the high range. Yeah, I feel like using a docile like almost forces the tongue to be kind of where the gums and the teeth meet. Whereas saying ta, you can say ta just right right on the bottom of the teeth, you know? Yeah, I also investigate, I ask them like, where where does it touch when you say the syllable? And I find that I'm in the minority, but there are other students like me. When I say da and ta, I don't feel any teeth at all. Mm -hmm. um, it's completely on the roof of my mouth, but when I think those things on the trumpet, I feel a little bit of the, I feel a good bit of the back of my teeth. So I try to figure out with the students, like, what do you feel when you do this? And if I'm running into trouble with like, they, they can't seem to like sensitize themselves to the spot, I'll do something like, okay, take the tip of your tongue and place it against the bottom ridge of your top teeth. Freeze it there, leave it there. Okay, now slide it a little higher until you can only feel the back of the teeth. You can't feel the bottom ridge and you can't yet feel the roof of your mouth. Okay, keep it there. All right, now slide it a little higher until you feel both the back of the teeth and the roof of the mouth. Okay, leave it there. All right, now slide it higher until you only... So they kind of get sensitive to like, oh, there are all these different places. And then usually I don't tell them where to go. I'll say, now tongue, and then tell me where you are going because they're a little more, you know, just kind of aware of what they're doing at that point. And then based upon what they tell me, then I might talk about like, okay, well, let's, let's maybe lower it a little bit and try to get more of the back of the teeth or... Oh, you're really in between your teeth. Can we raise it up so that you're just barely feeling the bottom ridge of the top teeth? Do you encounter students who want to move their jaw when they're articulating? Yes, that's hard to fix. Do you have any uh, awesome tricks for us on that one? <laughs> that, that's, I kind of go back to the mirror with that. Mm. And uh, seeing it, it, it there's, there's so many things that we do automatically as soon as we're kind of aware of it. You know, our brain is smarter than we are. You know, like it, it, does, it does things that we don't really understand or, or couldn't like really explain the process of. And I, and I think that, you know, when we use the mirror in that way and we see the physicality of it, we kind of figure out a lot of things on our own. So anytime I'm trying to fix a problem like that, whether it's the, the jaw moving thing or some of those other things I mentioned, like, like cheek puffing or another one that's similar is I call it a uh, chin bunching where, where like the bottom of their chin draws up mm. towards their towards their lips and that's a, that happens a lot especially when they're lip slurring upward with those kinds of things i'll like figure out okay what's like the most simple setting that we can get you to have like some amount of achievement with this like a really simple rhythm or just slurring if it's the chin bunching slurring upward and even though your chin moved after you slur upward draw it back down like as soon as they start to have some amount of achievement with it, then that just kind of opens the door to, okay, well, now let's be more demanding about when you prioritize this achievement and what you're, what you're trying to look at and do. But start really, really simple. Like that, that pattern that I said before, the da, rest, da, rest, da, 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 that, that kind of a thing to just watch what's happening and can you keep it still. Mm -hmm. Your handouts mentioned a lot about using chromatics to build range. How would you utilize that? Yes. So with my beginners, and this includes when I'm doing some like, sometimes I do sectional teaching for beginning classes. So I'll also, I'll make sure there's a handout for this, or if they're, if it's private, I'll just write it out by hand during the lesson. I write out the fingering sequence. I might put the note names with it. I don't really care about it at that point. Cause like they're going to learn music notation. Like they're, they're going to learn that with me. But when we're just producing sound on the trumpet, I, I, I give them as much like written stuff as possible to let them play as much as they can. So I'll write out the fingering sequence and, you know, our, whatever our entry point is every day, like you asked about first note, you know, so let's say first valve F is the entry point for this particular student or this class, you know, we'll start there and we'll play a couple of long tones on it. And then we'll move a half step higher or lower. I think it's a mistake not to move by chromatic steps or half steps at the early stages because 
the way the buzz changes and manipulates is significant when you're going those larger intervals. So if they're really learning to keep the buzz relaxed, keep it very connected and legato when it's it slurs between things, ch chromatic feels way easier for that than anything else. And all you have to do is write down the fingering sequence for them to be able to do it. I don't care if they know the names of the notes at that point. You wrote in the handout that you want the students to focus on compression and not lip tightness. How do you achieve compression? Uh, okay. All right. So, so that's, that's a higher concept one. That's not something that I'm going to talk about with a early student, maybe not in first year, maybe not in first few years. And, and, and that's in reference to like really when they truly start to work on the high range and we're talking about getting like leading towards high C that some type of a compression has to occur. And it's most typical that they will try to achieve that either through mouthpiece pressure or just by pressing their lips together really firmly. Mm. And I mean, those work to a point, but if you can achieve the compression through the speed of the air. That's going to be a, a much more efficient way of doing it. So you know, you, we talk about tongue position and just how to get the air really f fast to help those notes come out. But that's, that's definitely not something I don't really use the words compression with, with really young students. Maybe sometimes I'll say like, if a student has the, the buzz that we talked about, the, <laughs> that one, um, you know, I, I say, you know, you're really just kind of, you know, pressing your lips together really hard or you're over compressing them. You know, maybe I'll, mm. I'll use that word in that context with a beginner, but that's not the, the, the reference in the handout is not to, to the young students. Gotcha. There's this like, YouTube video where someone took like an MRI of a horn player going up through the partials. Have you seen this? Yes, I have. And you can see when it, when it gets very, very high, the tongue like really arches up towards the roof of the mouth. Yes. But that's not in the range that uh, beginners are going to be playing. <laughs> no, it's no, it's not. But I do talk about tongue positioning as soon as I feel like it, it makes sense to do so. And I think that the easiest place to learn how to move your tongue to help with the trumpet is with lip slurs. So usually, you know, a month or so into like true, true, not just like the, the high, low, high that I referenced, like on, on lower pitches when they're in their first weeks, but when things are a little more stabilized and maybe they can slur from a one in three G up to a one in three B or a two and three A flat to a two and three C using alternate fingerings around that point, I'll start to talk about, you know, if you, if you think, you know, moving from ah to E as you do that, and I, I use the, the garden hose analogy, you know, put your thumb over the garden hose and it, and it speeds up the water because the opening's smaller kind of thing. You usually they, they get that the first couple times they try it within the first couple times they try it. Sometimes it takes a while, but I find that that's the, the easiest place for them to learn that, oh, by moving my tongue, I can control the speed of the air. And then as they develop that, you know, I, I talk about, well, really throughout the range of the trumpet, your tongue is going to be in a, in a slightly different position. And I do talk, I actually got into this a little bit. I had, I had a master class with my students a couple of weeks ago with Joshua Kaufman, who is lead trumpet in the army blues and subs a lot with both the Met and the national symphony orchestra. So he, he knows the trumpet and one of my students that was playing for him made a tongue position comment. And he said, oh, I try not to overthink that. I don't think that blah, 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 blah. And, and I, I thought on that for a few days and had to unpack it because it's like I, I talk about it a good bit with with my younger students. And I and I I I agree with him and I don't that you have to learn it at some point. So you have to talk about it and you have to learn how to move your tongue. But at some point it does need to become a less mechanical. I'm arching my tongue and more a, you know, when you sing, your tongue moves and you don't think about it that much. But but you use some subtle positioning, raising and lowering and moving forward of it to help manipulate the pitch. I feel like with a lot of professionals, like who don't teach beginners, like there are, there's a lot of things along the way that they picked up very naturally that most people would not. <laughs> this is true. <laughs> this know? is true. So they um, may not think about it, but if you're instructing 20 people on how to play the trumpet, you may need to mention it for a lot of them, you know? Yes. Yeah. What about advanced topics like vibrato and double tonguing? Do you think that middle school students w might be ready for that? Or is that best left to kind they of might be. I'm going to, you know, I, I mentioned the, the, the flute episode <laughs> earlier and she made some statement about whatever they do in their first year is easy and everything else will always be hard. And that made me <laughs> scratch my head because, because there's some things that I don't do in the first year and it's made me wonder, hmm, maybe I'll try with vibrato. I usually don't introduce that until sometime in maybe early high school. It just depends on, on the student. Like it really, it's, it's student specific because I do think it needs to be a mostly one-on-one -on -one topic 
because because you need to hear yourself individually. I think mm. like group vibrato practice isn't conducive to actually developing a usable vibrato. I, I, I don't really think that that's a good setting for that. And, you know, in, in most band playing, you don't want your trumpet section using vibrato. Okay. You want you want the tone to be straight, but, but I will like when it, when a student starts to get into more, more lyrical playing, I like to give a lyrical etude every week. Once they get old enough to, you know, in, handle that along with a technical one, then we'll start talking about it a bit. And I usually do something like, you know, put your metronome on and start with, you know, quarter note vibrato impulses, then eighth notes, then triplets and play with how wide versus narrow it is. And then switch between one and the other. So they do it in sort of a very controlled mechanical setting. And then, you know, maybe we'll say, okay, now take your, take the, the second Clark study, da, da, dee, da, 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 dee, da, and every fourth note of the sequence, pause and put vibrato on it. Da, da, dee, vibrato, da, da, dee, da, you know, and, and, and freeze on that. So it's like, it's still kind of an exercise, but it's a little more musical. And then, okay, now take this piece of music or this lyrical etude and anything that's longer than a dotted quarter note you know, put some vibrato on it, depending on just kind of what the, the speed of it is. When you're doing vibrato yourself, do you feel like you're doing it more with motion of, of the trumpet or with your diaphragm or something else? The more I'm thinking about it while I do it, the worse I sound. <laughs> I, I definitely don't use hand vibrato. I usually like demonstrate that to students. It's not really the preferred style of vibrato. It's that, that's more, more, more an older thing that the players used to use a lot of hand vibrato and it has a very specific sound to it and it can be done really tastefully and, you know, it can be an effective tool, but I, I use a jaw vibrato and by moving the jaw, what you're really kind of doing is just manipulating the embouchure of the aperture a bit so that you get that, that, that impulse in the sound. Mm -hmm. All right, let's, let's switch gears a little bit. Obviously, braces can be a big hurdle for a lot of brass students. So do you have some tips on how to adapt a kid who's either received braces or had braces taken off? Yes. One thing that I always tell them before they get them, and hopefully they tell me that they're going to get them. Sometimes they show up and they're like, hey, I just got braces. I was like, oh, I wish I'd talked to you beforehand. I, I, I tell them, first of all, don't play for like two days. Like somebody was in your mouth for like two hours and you were all stretched out and you're going to be swollen. Like don't, don't try to learn trumpet anew on, on a swollen set of lips that are still aggravated. Like just let things settle down for a couple of days. And then I explained to them that like, you basically need to learn how to bring your lips together again. You've now mm. got this extra material that's in front of your teeth. So your lips are going to feel like they have to move further to get themselves together and will be very kind of slow in the process of doing that on, on long tones and in easy range. We might, we might use the, this is a great you know, time to use the lead pipe to just kind of focus on the easiness of, of sound production, but it, try to, try to get them to make an easy sound. And then when, when the sound finally, you know, like, oh, okay, now I'm kind of drawing my lips. I feel like I have about the same amount of lip in the mouthpiece than before, as, as I did before, even though I have to move my lips further to get there. When they start to get some control and permanence with that, then, okay, now let's start to move chromatically up and down and let's start to do these exercises again. I really treat beginners, embouchure changes, and braces adjustments kind of all very similarly, that we just kind of go back to just... Let's make an easy sound on a mid-range note. And once it stabilizes as sounding good, let's start to move it around more and more, but be very sequential, be very chromatic in, in, in the way that we move to, to get around the instrument again. And inevitably, for some of the kids, it, it, their life is just going to be easier if they switch to something different. I, I, you know, that's not a lot of them, but I am convinced that that's some of them, that once the braces are a factor, they just might not be able to bring their lips together in a way that it, th that it's easy enough to make a sound. And you kind of have to have the convo, you know, do you want to fight with this for two years or, you know, like here's this larger brass instrument with a larger mouthpiece. It doesn't sit so directly on your braces. You know, it, it, the mouthpiece encompasses more of the lips. It, it's going to be a little less difficult to get a buzz. And then if it is. You know, maybe that's a place to be for a couple of years. And I've had students that have done that and then come back to trumpet. And I've had students that have done that and then stayed on whatever that instrument is. Yeah, there does seem to be a pretty wide range. I remember one of my, my good friends from high school, she got braces and literally couldn't play trumpet again. 
like just could not. And she tried and tried and it just was not happening with the braces. And then on the flip side, I think it's funny you mentioned uh, students telling you in advance that they're going to get it. I had a student a few years back who we were like four days from our final concert of eighth grade. And she had a trumpet solo in this. I think it was Andromeda Overture. And there's this like very long trumpet solo. That, yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. So this uh-huh. very long trumpet solo in the middle sort of sounds vaguely like Princess Leia's theme. And and she had the most beautiful trumpet tone. Like it just sounds amazing with braces. Amazing tone. And then she comes up to me and says, hey, yeah, I'm getting my braces off tomorrow. And it's like four days for the concert. I was like, what? What are you doing to me? What are you doing? And, you know, she had her braces taken off and the next day came in and sounded exactly the same. And I was like, are you some kind of superhuman? Like, like literally played the concert, didn't make a single mistake. I'm like, I, I don't I don't know what that like, that might be an outlier on the realm. Of- <laughs> I, that, that happens. Like I, I run into that a little bit that like either the braces transition basically seems non-existent, like nothing has changed. Or I actually have a current student who had been with me for about eight months, pretty young player. I think it has had done about a year playing before he came to me and had an embouchure that I'm like, oh, I don't really know if we're going to need to change this or not. Like I need to just kind of observe it for a while. And he got braces on and actually it's better. Like I think he, <laughs> for some reason, just in, in that transition, he's figured out how to, his issue was he was really low with, with his mouthpiece placement and in that transition managed to get more upper lip. This, this reminds me, this is, this is a, a big point, and I probably should have mentioned it earlier that I, I think is really important to aim for when you're setting up your young students. The mouthpiece needs to be high enough. If there's one problem that I see come in over and over and over again that is always problematic, it's when the mouthpiece is too low. Do you mean and like there's more bottom lip than top lip? I don't even think of it that way. So okay. I, I think what you want to aim for is, so you have the rim of the mouthpiece, And you could say there's the outer rim and then there's the inner rim. And the inner rim is what leaves the, you know, if you see a trumpet player that's played for a while, you can, you can see a ring. Okay. So the inner rim is what leaves the ring. You want the inner rim of the mouthpiece to sit above the pink of the lip. Maybe only a a small amount. If, If a student has really thin lips, it might be quite a bit, but that should be a big priority in in getting the mouthpiece placed when they're when they're getting set up if it's down in if if that rim is sitting into the pink of the lip that is extremely problematic for tone production for for gaining range and is the most frequent reason that i take a student through an embouchure change process which i hate to do i think that embouchure changes are just the worst from Mm. from from all aspects so i avoid them at all costs but if they have to be done, it's almost always because of that, that the mouthpiece is too low and they're hitting a, a major wall because of that. So if a student has like very, very full lips, they might be rolling in more than a typical yes, student? Yes, you'll reach that point where you've rolled in too much and that becomes problematic. So mm. I, I do have some students that get around the instrument pretty well and they're not above the pink of the lip. They have some problems in their playing, but like... I, it, you have to you have to kind of assess like well what do you want to get out of the trumpet like am I trying to help you enjoy high school band as best you can and then go on to college so like let's let's just maximize this like not perfect embouchure to do as much as you can on it so you enjoy things or are you looking to be a music major and need it to function better so we should do a do an embouchure change you know like it's just there's a lot of decisions that go into whether or not to to make a change with how a student is set up. And in general, I try to avoid it. So get it get yeah. it right from the start. Well, I teach uh, band year one, two, and three. So I always just have my students play on a 7C and just kind of forget about it. But I noticed you mentioned in your handout that students, I think you said they'll feel and sound better on a 5C after a couple of years. Could you explain why that okay. is? They they might feel and sound better. Uh, on a, okay. it's, it, it's, it's really pretty personal, like for, from student to student, what feels and sounds good and when that happens, most students, like if we're talking in generalities, most students are going to do well on a 7C at the beginning. Most students at some point after a year or two or three of playing will feel better on something bigger. And a 5C is a little bigger than a 7. A 3C is a little bigger than a 5. Those three sizes, a 7C, 5C, and 3C are kind of like your good all purpose they 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 work for a ton of trumpet players those are the typical ones that a student will progress through and i shouldn't even use the word progress because 
it implies that being on something bigger is better and it isn't in all situations. There's a lot of professional players that play on something in more, more the five area. And there's a lot of professional players that play on things that are really big, but it just kind of, it, it depends on what, what fits the, the way you form your embouchure in play. But usually after a year of playing year and a half, that's when I'll, I'll just let a student try a larger mouthpiece. And you can usually hear a difference right away, that the sound is a little more open when they go to something bigger. And the students can also usually feel a difference right away that, that like, oh yeah, there's like, there's more space in this that I feel like I can like, I can just do more. I can get more air through it. Or, you know, I can, I have better control of what I'm doing with my lips inside the mouthpiece. So, you know, sometime, if we're just talking generically, you know, sometime middle to late middle school, try a five and or a three, and then if you've been on the five a couple of years, maybe in early high school, try the three. And if a three feels and works better, make that change or, or don't, but don't definitely don't be the band director that, that says, you know, you're in the high school band. Now every kid has to be on a three C. I, th I think it's just good to have a set available for them to try and what kind of feels the easiest to move around the trumpet with and what sounds the best should be what you go with. It kind of reminds me of uh, read players who sometimes think like the harder the read, like the better of a player you are, which is not sure. Yeah, there's the totally case. that that exists in the trumpet. <laughs> so the trumpet world is totally like it's obsessed about like, oh yeah, I, I play on a one X, you know, like which is like <laughs> like but when Bach got so big, you know, their 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 size one is their largest, but I guess they, there's they, they needed something larger or like maybe it's an older style that they they that is a little bigger that they put the X next to it. Um, oh my anyway, <laughs> so if you're moving from like a 7C to a 3C, for example, would you find the biggest change to be in like tone or flexibility or range or wh what does it affect the most when you change that cup size? All, all of that. So definitely going to a, a, a and, and so, so the, the box sizing system, it's very not exact when, when, you know, when. Vincent Bach developed these mouthpieces a long time ago. It, you know, the, the sizes don't have to do with like very specific measurements. And there's all these other factors that go into it, like the, the angle of the rim, like how quickly does the, the, the rim turn into the cup or how flat or how contoured is there? There are so many aspects to a mouthpiece that you shouldn't just think of it as, you know, like cup size getting bigger or the rim diameter getting larger. Those are kind of like they do get a little bigger. The rim gets a little bigger when you move from seven to five to three. The cup stays more the same though. The, the mm. C afterward has to do with the cup volume and shape, but they are slightly different on those three mouthpieces. But the student will, will should be able to tell pretty immediately that like flexibility is either a little easier or not. Range is either a little easier or not. And sound is either better or not. And the only one that like, maybe you'll say, okay, this one's harder right now, but let's just wait on it. Cause like, as you get used to the mouthpiece, maybe it'll be better is, you know, if they switch to a larger one and high notes are a little harder, but you can tell like, well, you're still like producing it with, with like efficacy, you know, you're still like, like doing, doing it the right way. You're not just jamming the thing into your face, you know, that their embouchure will learn and adjust to it. So I might, you know, leave a, a, a student on a mouthpiece as a trial period for a couple of weeks to see, like, let's see how you adapt to it before we make a, a decision. Have you ever played on a 3D printed mouthpiece? Yes. Um, what is it? What is it? Warburton makes the, the P-Trumpet, um, which is, I think, I think that's who makes the, the P-Bone also. Mm -hmm. And I had a, a beginning student recently that she was very young, was in second grade. And that's what their, their parents, like somebody had gifted it and it, it plays okay. I actually had them use not the plastic mouthpiece that comes with it. That's mm. the one thing that I changed because when, when I played on it, it just felt way too weird. And I, and it wasn't really labeled what it was. So it, it felt like, it, like not the right thing. So I, <laughs> they kept the, the, the plastic trumpet and started on that, but, uh, but they got hold of a, a, a metal mouthpiece. Yeah, last time I used one, I had a student who's now an engineer making, you know, eight times my salary. But when he was a middle school student, he 3D printed a whole bunch of mouthpieces he just found designs for online. And we tried them and I, I found at least, I'm, I'm not sure if the printer resolution or the design of the mouthpiece factors into this, but it wouldn't lock into the partials as accurately as a regular mouthpiece. It would like slip around a little bit. But I don't know, I think maybe the technology will get so good eventually. I'm sure it will. And there are some manufacturers that use synthetic rims. 
Like I, I have I've had a couple of friends that are good trumpet players, but realized that they had some type of a metal allergy, so couldn't really use just a, a, a traditional style mouthpiece. So they had the, the rim of the mouthpiece removed, cut off, and, you know, some type of like a Lexan or, or you know, synthetic rim created and put on that. And there are a lot of, of players that play on those and you, you I, I can't hear any sound difference. Have you had experience with students bringing in like those super cheap, um, like Amazon trumpets that are like $80? Yes. It's very hit or miss. And it's not like the hits are, are great hits. There are so many of them that I, I've lost ability to like keep track of which ones are kind of okay. Mm. I, if, if, if it, I'll, I'll play it, you know, I'll, I'll take my mouthpiece and play it. And if it feels all right and it operates okay, I don't, I don't tell the parent, you know, you bought this thing that you shouldn't have. If, if it feels like it plays well enough to get started with. There are some that are on the cheaper end, like I want to say in the more in like the two, three hundred dollar range that actually I think, you know, I've picked up and played and they're, they're, they're decent. They're, they'd be a place that a student could be for, for a couple of years before, you know, making a decision. Cause there's, there's so much that goes into the, like deciding like when you buy, you know, a, a student level versus a pro level versus intermediate. You know, whether you want to have another one for marching band after you've bought your nice horn for, you know, what. So there's, there's a lot of factors that go into it. So I don't just instantly say, get rid of that thing. <laughs> but they, they can, they can be problematic, but it's more, I've found them to be more problematic with mechanically how they operate necessarily than how they play. I and mean, maybe the two kind of go hand in hand, but in situations where I've told a family to get something different because of what they bought, it's more been because of the, the way the, the valves lack operation than, yeah. than how it plays. Yeah. I was just having this discussion with my, my rising sixth grade families. We had this like band orientation and, um, I've seen a lot more of them last year than I've seen in previous years, because I think with all the, the pandemic shutdowns and I'm in a very high poverty area. So with all the pandemic shutdowns, I think a lot of families just don't have money. You yes. Know? Like they're, they're still struggling to catch up from the income lost when they got laid off from their job and were out of work for months until things open back up. So I've seen a lot more of them recently, but I think at least what I've noticed from the trombones, I, I've seen more of than the trumpets necessarily and, and flutes too, you know, a, a lot of the hundred dollar flutes is it, like, they sound okay at first, but the issue is like they use metal that's so cheap that everything bends so easily. Mm. So like one small accident with the instrument and then it's unplayable. And a lot of times they use parts that aren't standard. So our, our music shop won't repair them. Cause they're like, we, we don't have a part that'll even fit that, you know, like they yeah. don't use any kind of standard parts. So I usually tell my kids, I was like, look, if you want to use that as a practice instrument at home, that's cool. But if you can't afford like a decent starter instrument, I'll let you use one of mine. And sure. Or, or get a used instrument. I mean, used, used brass instruments are great. I mean, there's not, yeah. if they've been well, even if they've only been semi well maintained, it, it's, it's a really good option, you know? There's going to be people in your community that, that, you know, played through high school and then don't play anymore. Like find out who these people are and, you know, maybe a month after graduating, they're not ready to sell it yet, but a year after graduating, they realize that, yeah, maybe I'm not going to pick that thing up anymore and it could, it could be put to better use or search online. There's just a lot of stuff available used that, you know, plays great. Or if you've got a good relationship with your local music you know, store or repair technician that like, well, I'm going to buy this thing that I, I know it's not in like great condition, but it looks like it just needs like a little bit of work. Um, you know, the, you've got somebody that you can bring it to, to get it in, in, in better shape. But that's, that's a good option to, to keep the cost down. Yeah. I always tell my parents that's like the best bang for your buck. Cause you can have like, I don't know, a $1,500 saxophone or something that somebody is about to go off to college and they'll sell it to you for like 200 bucks. You know, and it's like, That's, sweet, I'll just bring it to the shop, get $50 of repairs, and now we're good to go. You right. Know? Yeah. Awesome. Okay. So I did want to ask you, what are your go-to recommendations for students to hear really amazing trumpet tone? So this, this is one question that you, you, you know, you sent some of these to me ahead of time and, and I thought about it and I was like, you know, I think more important than getting the civic person right is like get something that's going to make them want to listen to trumpet. Mm. So I'm more apt to say like, you know, listen to these Canadian brass albums that are like light and fun or, you know, like, like empire brass, some of their stuff from, from the eighties and nineties there, there are some that are just, it's just really fun stuff and it's, it's great trumpet playing, you know, and whether or not, I mean, and it's great tone too. I'm not saying it's bad tone. I mean, it's, it's phenomenal tone, but I don't necessarily like look for like, 
the person that like, you need to listen to this person and try to sound like them with mm -hmm. an older student. Maybe like if, if I know that they're listening on a regular basis, then we really start to talk about specifics. Like, you know, this person and like, who do you like? And like, why do you want to sound like them? But from a young age, just like make it fun. And a good, a great album is that I recommend a lot is the, the Wynton Marsalis Carnival album with the Eastman Wind Ensemble, both because it's phenomenal trumpet playing. It sounds good. And it's, it, it's like, I think one of the best recorded band albums that there is. Like, if you're going to like talk about like just how, how well a band on record sounds, both in regard to the tone of the ensemble and the, 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 the technical prowess of the playing, that's, that's just an, inc an incredible album. And I, I love to kind of let that be one of the first things that I say, Hey, listen, listen, listen to this. Yeah. He has such amazing, like classical jazz crossover stuff. Yes. And, just... and so there's an example of like, you know, he's a crossover player that does both well. And maybe you wouldn't say in either of those idioms that he's like, like the person you would point to is like sound like that, but, but does great. You know, he sounds amazing, phenomenal. So like, I'm not going to prioritize necessarily like, like it's like, I want you to sound exactly like that person. Like that, that's just a super fun album that I think kids like to listen to, you know, if, if they're into trumpet. All right, well, I have three final questions I'd like to ask everybody, but before we hit that, do you feel like there's anything that we missed or anything that you would want to highlight that we didn't talk about today? Okay, I have two, and they're both pr relatively quick. One is when beginning band methods introduce dynamics, I think it's a little too early for a lot of brass players that, that, mm. that they're still like just learning to make a consistent good sound. So I, I use beginning band methods in my private teaching for my really young students, and I usually just ignore dynamics for a little bit longer. <laughs> and then when we decide that, okay, like you're stable enough now to, 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 to work on playing at different volumes, then we work on it with exercises first and we play long tones from loud to soft and soft to loud. And we articulate from loud to soft and soft to loud and, you know, develop it that way before then, okay, now let's put it with music. So I think if, if the students don't sound good while they're playing with dynamics, punt and save it for later. And the other has to do, I think this is, this is probably true of all instruments, but I, I, I definitely hear with, with my trumpet students that in rapid tonguing, like as tonguing gets faster, the tongue tends to stiffen and the air gets like backed up. So like, you know, you've got some sort mm. of a rapid passage that if, if you heard their air stream, it'd be something like, you know, it's like super backed up and the tongue is, 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 is just hard as can be. And if you can get them to, to just think more relaxed, tongue relaxed, air relaxed, Da 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 instead of type of a thing. I, I run into that a lot and don't find it that hard of a thing to to actually address and correct once you do it. All right, that brings us to our final three questions. So question number one, do you have a mentor shout out? I have a lot. I everybody who I studied trumpet with in, you know, a very formal capacity at at, at James Madison, that was Jim Kleesner. I did my master's at Bowling Green in Ohio, and that was George Novak. I learned a ton from them. I have learned so much though, from people who I went to school with, who are now off doing really neat things in, in, in the trumpet world. And I don't want to start naming because there's like a lot of them and I'll, I'll, I'll miss some, but I have a lot of good friends that are just doing neat things in the trumpet world. And I, I ask them stuff all the time and really value having, having those connections. All right. Number two, do you have a favorite middle school band piece? I don't know that I can name specific pieces. I prioritize doing things that have melodic and lyrical qualities to them. And I think sometimes we as teachers avoid that more than we should. Um, I definitely <laughs> played stuff that I would categorize as we're doing this because it's fun. I definitely did some of that. I place a really big emphasis on like, there needs to be a, a like a lyrical quality. And I don't mean that it can't be fast and rhythmic, but there needs to be like lyricism and musicality to it. Okay. Number three, name a band director who's crushing it right now. I already said I'm, I'm in Martin Blount and Sammy Charles's, uh, Charles's classroom twice a week. And I always just think, wow, you're doing an awesome job. There's a lot of people. I, I, I'm really lucky to teach, teach sectionals and private lessons at, at a variety of schools. So I walk into a lot of band rooms and there's, there's just a ton of really great teaching going on in, in Virginia. I and mean, I th think that's great. All right. Well, thank you so much for coming on to the show today. I've had a really good time. Yeah. Thank you. This has been a lot of fun. Thanks for joining us on The Flying Baton. Remember, may your tone be dark and your humor light.